A special thank you to everyone who's been listening and watching these episodes. It means a lot that there's a huge audience. The audio listenership is very big. Hundreds of thousands of people have tuned in since I started this podcast. Um, the unique listenership is big. The consistent listenership is in the thousands. Um, the visual viewership, if you will, the YouTube audience isn't that big. Um, I am putting extra effort into the videos, trying to make them look as uh, appealing as possible without overspending. So everyone who's been donating through Patreon and PayPal, thank you. You've helped me improve my equipment. Um, I will ask for a small favor. If you can subscribe to this channel, it would mean a lot. And if you can like or comment on this episode, it means a great deal. Um, algorithm related stuff. So just to make sure the channel is visible and that uh, people do notice that there's a video version to the podcast. It just means you have to engage a bit more, if you will. Um, so just a matter of liking, subscribing, commenting, you name it. So without further ado, Sami Jmeir. <laughs> occurred to me that we initially scheduled this conversation yesterday and then we had to postpone it by one day it was your brother Pierre's birthday yesterday and I know the feeling that birthdays are private matters there's they're really family occasions and friends the public remembers the anniversary of the assassination I don't think many people know the birthday so that, for me, was very important. I think we have something very uh, difficult that we share. I think it's a scar. And in your case, it's not just your late brother, Pierre. It's your uncle, Bashir. It's your family's legacy. In my own world, it's my father. And I know we're different people. You're the current president of Kata'ib. I'm a podcast guy. <laughs> we have different lives. But we share that important bond. And for me, it's two things. It's a scar, but it's also purpose. And I was wondering if you feel the same way. It's a real pleasure and, um, to have you here and to have this conversation and do this uh, small episode. Sometimes people cross each other, mm. different fate. Uh, different fates cross each other on on a journey, and uh, it is true that uh, we don't look at things the same way others do. Mm. You and me, we have different perspectives. We have different angles when we look at some uh, events that occur in our country. Uh, a lot of uh, emotions comes in, uh, come in. A lot of uh, uh, background um, resurface uh, yeah. at some point. But uh, to answer your question, I would say that um, I think that the way um, the assassination of my brother was not the first drama in the family. We have uh, five members of my family who died um, by assassinations or um, in, in some fights. Um, my cousin Maya, the yes. daughter of Bashir, yeah. was uh, killed in a, in a car, uh, car explosion. Uh, my cousin Amin, uh, died in 76, April 1976, during the war. 
my other cousin Manuel Jmail also died uh, in the war. So uh, since I was born, <coughs> it's like uh, it's like the whole purpose of this family is to defend this country, and uh, we are raised in a way to put the country first. Mm. So when I married my wife, to give you an example, <laughs> before I married her, and she maybe one day you can ask her about that, <laughs> I told her you have to know that you will always be second in my priority. First priority is Lebanon. Um, so everything that happened in this family, all the fights, all the, the assassinations, all the, the dramatic events, it uh, made things in a way that we feel that we have a purpose. Uh, there is a purpose from our life. First of all, our life is dispensable. Mm. The priority is not us, uh, us as individuals. Mm. It's what we are defending. So when my brother died and he was assassinated, it was uh, it increased this um, feeling of sacrifice of sacrifice in each and every one of us. So it was like an additional event that anchored us in this fight for Lebanon. What is very um, I would say uh, uh, dramatic in this is to see where Lebanon is today yeah. after all the sacrifices that were given. Yeah. When you see the situation we live in, we gave our life for a better Lebanon. Yeah. Unfortunately, Lebanon is moving backwards and we are, uh, uh, we are much worse than we were 20 years ago, or 30 years ago, or 60 years ago. We are the only country that <laughs> is moving backwards. We are the only country that used to have a train and, they, and it, do, it doesn't anymore. We used to have electricity 24 hours, we don't have it anymore. We used to have an infrastructure that is the best in the region, we don't have it anymore. We used to have the best uh, schools, the best universities, we don't have it anymore. We used to be one of the highest GDP per capita in the world. Today we are one of the poorest people in the world. Um, <clears throat> plus, uh, this whole fight for independence and sovereignty, when will it end? This is the question that you ask yourself. We've been fighting for the independence and sovereignty of this country for the past 100 years, <laughs> and we're still fighting for that? Is it the fate of my children to continue to fight the same fight that um, my brother, my uncle, all these people paid the high price for? This is, these are questions that I'm asking myself today. You know, I, I, you're very nice to let me ask you a question like this uh, unprepared. And I know it's, I mean, it's a familiar feeling that we talk about it so much. And it's almost at times autopilot that we've, we're used to talking about it. But the reason I wanted to start at this uh, sensitive point is because I remember, and you, you correct me if I'm wrong, before Pierre's assassination, you were in Lubnanuna, if I remember the word right, it was Lubnanuna. But this is um, going back to 2005, 2006, and I remember that name being associated. So I know that you were involved, on your terms, politically. And then with your brother's assassination, did it make it impossible for you to ever think about doing something else? And I'm trying to relate here. Before my father's assassination, I was politically curious. I had my own opinions about what happened, mm. 
but there was a switch that happened after his death. Let, let me tell you something. Uh, a lot of uh, young people don't know that I am um, an activist since I'm 17 years old. Right. Yeah. Since I was in school. At that time, our country was occupied was yeah. occupied by the Syrian uh, army. And as a student, I used to... Um, I participated in each and every demonstration yeah. that happened between 1997 until 2005, until yeah. the uh, withdrawal and March 14th and the whole Cedar Revolution. I was there uh, in each and every demonstration. I used to... Um, Maybe um, uh, when I was at school first, before I joined USG in uh, 1998. In 1997, I used to uh, uh, climb the wall of my school, Lycée Francais, and uh, escape from school to go to USG <laughs> to participate in the first few demonstrations that happened at that time. Then when I got to USG, I was... Uh, my main focus in life. It was not uh, my low degree. It was uh, mm. um, fighting the Syrians at that time. As a teenager, you were able to know what your destiny was. I but always, for me, Lebanon first, and fighting for Lebanon yeah. and the independence of Lebanon um, since I was very, very young. Mm -hmm. And I was an activist before yeah. becoming... Um, someone involved in politics. I was an activist, and right. I still think as an activist. I don't think as a politician, and this is why I'm doing things different, differently than the others. Because mm -hmm. I'm not a politician. I'm an activist, and um, uh, this is why I'm not into, uh, you know, the business politics that we have in Lebanon. <laughs> out of this. I cannot do that. I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to uh, be a compromise uh, person. I don't know how to, uh, uh, let's say, uh, bargain, all that stuff. I, I, I don't believe in that. I don't, it's not in me. And I don't think that it helps the country. I think that this mentality destroyed the country. We have many common friends from civil society. And when I mentioned that I was doing an episode with you, they all spoke highly about those years. And I remember those years. You couldn't easily talk about the Syrian regime in mm. Lebanon. I was arrested several times. Yeah. I was beaten. Yeah. Uh, it, I was threatened. I had to leave the country for a few right. weeks. I was 22 years old. Um, it was a very, a very tough period. And but it was clearer than today because we knew who we were fighting. <laughs> right. That's actually well said. And I think knowing how hard it was back then to even say the word Syria or talk about the Syrian regime, I mean, this is at a time when people forget. Even the words meant something else. People talk about words as if they're permanent in Lebanon. They're not. Kateb paid a price under Syrian influence. And I remember, even in those years, there was a, a false division within Kata'ib because of those years. And your return to Lebanon, I hope I remember this right, it's prior to your father's return. Yeah, exactly. So you were a teenager, yeah. charting your own path. So that, for me, is, a, is an interesting difference we have, that you knew what your destiny was from an early stage. I think I came later. And for that reason, I think our age is also an advantage. We're both old enough to remember how bad things were during the Civil War, how difficult politics was under Syrian occupation, and what 2005 really was at the end of the day. Lebanese going to the streets, demanding what you said earlier, sovereignty and independence, things that Lebanon has been denied. So I'd like to take us back a bit. 2005 is a very important year, but I think Lebanon's history uh, is worth talking about a little. And Kate'ib is one of the founding parties in this country. It predates Lebanon's independence. 1936, French mandate. This party is established. 
It's a national party. It's an important party, and it grows in influence. By the late 1950s, it's in the Fuad Sheb government. It's playing a role in state building. It's playing a role not just in politics and sports. I have two uncles that were in Kate'ib sports clubs in Tripoli. That's in the 1950s and 1960s. So to imagine that today is it's almost, um, I mean, it's living memory, but I don't think people know this necessarily. You could be on the streets of Tripoli and a member of Kate'ib because you're playing sports in Tripoli. And something we talked about briefly before, I have an uncle. I have an uncle who was a member of Kate'ib. So that seems almost um, folklore today. But this party, which was very big and uh, national, it changed. And I think the changes should be touched on a bit. al kataib was a Lebanese militia that became part of the civil war. I think al kataib found itself in a situation where another militia, Fatah in, in, in those years, contributed to the breakdown of Lebanon's sovereignty. And al kataib made a decision that was in light of that. And I think that may help explain why it's not just a story about militia killing each other, that Lebanon's sovereignty, it took years before the civil war started. But those years, 1970 to 1975, al kataib became part of the uglier side of the story because of a militia that was in this country. Now, this automatically will divide opinions, but I'm curious if that's how you see it or if you see it in any different way. Unfortunately, um, war is never clean. There is no clean war. Uh, what I always emphasize on is that uh, the war didn't start between Kateb and the Palestinians. It started between, uh, when I talk Palestinian, I talk about Fatah. Yeah. It started between Fatah and the Lebanese army. Yeah. So you have to go back to 1969. From 1969 to 1975, the clashes that happened on the Lebanese soil were not between Kateb and Fatah. It was between Fatah and the Lebanese army. And um, in 1975, when the Lebanese state and the president of Lebanon decided to uh, stop this, uh, uh, this uh, aggression on the sovereignty of Lebanon by Fatah that was spreading its militia all over the country near the, uh, the camps uh, around Beirut, etc. Uh, the president was blocked by the prime minister. The prime minister resigned. And the, he couldn't move the army anymore. So he uh, said to our party president at that time, Pierre Jmaillet, yes. and to Camille Chamon, he told them, I cannot do anything anymore. Right. So you have to defend yourself. Yeah. This is how it started. Once a war starts, you cannot control how things go because a war is, by definition, ugly. So, uh, yes, I think if we had a strong Lebanese state, a strong army, statesmen that put Lebanon first, the Lebanese war wouldn't have happened. This, this statement, to me, is logical, it's rational, and it also exposes that terrible things happened that everyone is accountable for during the Civil War. I'm curious in your mind, why do you think that's such a hard selling point to many people today when they refer to these parties? And I'll, I'll give you an example. I've had conversations where if you say the word Kate'ib, or let alone if you say the family name Shmeyir, 
there's a misunderstanding that emerges very quickly. And you're talking civil war only. Civil war, ugly, responsibility, murder. Because this war is a turning point in the history of Lebanon. It's a turning point in the history of our party. As you said, your uncle, who is a Sunni Lebanese citizen from Tripoli, was a member of the, the Lebanese Kata'i party because our party was created to be a national country, a national party yeah. that defends all Lebanon. And that uh, is, uh, its goal is to create a nation uh, and to um, fill the gaps and um, close all the gaps between all the Lebanese people and get everyone together to believe in one country, which is Lebanon. This is, it was an, uh, the, the, the target of Kata'ib had always was to build a nation, a Lebanese citizenship, regardless of religion, uh, and to separate totally religion from state. This was always the objective of Qatar. When the war started and Lebanon was divided and Christians were on one side and Muslims were on the other side, then um, the whole concept of the party was um, misled. It, 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 we, we, um, all the Lebanese people were dragged to something that destroyed a lot of our, um, our unity. So I understand that people, um, unfortunately, only remember this part of history. Mm. They don't mm. uh, remember what happened before that and what we actually uh, stood for and still mm. stand for today. What I am doing today is to go back to the roots and bring back Kata'ib as a national party that defends all Lebanon and with a clear objective is to create a sovereign, independent, um, a modern and um, a modern state and have a, a, a real Lebanese citizenship, a feel of belonging to a country, the feel of belonging to a, to a nation, a Lebanese nation. And unfortunately, um, what happened in the war uh, is still something that um, uh, is, um, I would say, uh, uh, it's an issue between the Lebanese. And it wasn't solved because we couldn't, after the war, sit together and do this truth and reconciliation process. And the issue is not only with Kata'ib. The issue is between sects. When you talk to Christians that are not Kata'ib, you will hear things negative about the other sects. When you sit with Shia people, you will hear things that are negative towards other sects. When you sit with uh, Sunni, with Druze, there is, Lebanon today is fragmented, and you are still paying the price of war. And parties like Kata'ib are paying also the price that Lebanon is uh, is paying and the Lebanese people are paying, which is the division of our people uh, into uh, different ways of, of, of dealing. So for me, uh, uh, we have to rebuild that. And what I'm doing every day is to try to break the boundaries, to explain, to open up, um, to sit with people that are um, ideologically or even um, from their family yeah. uh, history, etc., they used to be against Qatar and try to explain to them that there is a new era, that uh, try to understand what happened, why it happened, and how we should do things in a way that history doesn't repeat itself. I'm going to ask, I mean, this is from... It's, it's both personal and it's, in a way, generational. Um, I've noticed something, that the older generation that saw Lebanon collapse and watched the worst part of our history, they've been able to move on <clears throat> largely, I think, from what those words meant during the war. And I'll give you an example. 
I've met too many extended relatives that you say kata'ib and they sort of, it's almost a, um, you're bringing them back to the 1980s. But if you talk about kata'ib now and the politics today, it's almost 100% in line. So it's the same word that means different things. And I think that's the value of this perspective. I don't know if the younger generation has that. And my understanding so far is that the younger you get in this protest movement, the more pure it becomes, which is if anyone was involved in Lebanon's politics up until 2019, at any point, they're part of the problem. I'm curious if that, if that is something that can be addressed. And I know Kate'ib, and you in particular, you've taken steps which are unique. You've been in the opposition for years now, prior to October 2019. You've publicly stated why. I remember interviews that you gave almost 10 years ago now. You're explaining why you think this government is not correct and it lacks sovereignty. It's handing the country to Hezbollah. Prior to people saying it now, you were saying it years ago. You opposed many things that pushed Lebanon over the edge. It's also important. This is not a Jamail family company. There's been, what, seven? Seven presidents? Seven presidents. Five of them are not Beit Jamail. So that is also very important. There's a crowd in the opposition that just doesn't want to hear it. They want everyone, part of the old guard, out. Is there anything that can be done to maybe massage that view and make Kata'ib even more accessible to the very, very, uh, I think, rightfully angry protester who wants to see change? First of all, we have to do everything to always do the right things and say the right things. And this mm. is what we're doing. Mm. Uh, to... to uh, uh, m mistakes are not allowed from our side. Mm. Let's start from from here. Then there is a huge uh, effort of explaining yeah. that we have to do, and what we're doing together today is part of it. Um, there are some of them that are um, genuine, and uh, some of them they criticize us or they attack us from, a, I would say, puristic or um, a legitimate, um, or not legitimate, I would Almost say. Almost absolute uh, Yes, term, and yeah. without any bad intentions. It's right, their belief. Right. Yeah. Okay, they are wrong. Maybe they don't know, they don't know enough about the history of Lebanon. They don't know enough about us, about our path, about right. our fight from uh, seven, eight, nine years ago until yes. today. They don't know what we did in the parliament. They don't know that we are uh, in the opposition since a long time. They don't know uh, that we opposed all the budgets that were voted that destroyed our country alone in the parliament. Yeah. They don't know all of that. So this kind of people, I'm ready to sit with them and discuss and continue to uh, explain and all that stuff. I think that this category of people that, uh, because we have to acknowledge that uh, we did a huge effort that mm, I would say today 70 or 80% of uh, the opposition youth is okay with us. Right. And we still yeah. have this portion that is still negative. Mm, mm. So I'm talking about this portion. Mm. I would say maybe 30% of it is from maybe they don't know, maybe uh, they didn't read enough, they don't know enough about us, about our path. Some of them are too much ideologically driven. They will not, uh, they don't want to uh, accept uh, the fact that Kata'ib is uh, a change uh, movement today mm. because they, uh, their parents are, um, they inherited from their parents uh, very extreme uh, ideas against Kata'ib and they don't want to move on. Mm. 
And the third category, and I think this is the category that is the most influential today and that do, uh, doing a lot of damage, uh, people that have personal interest into not letting kata'ib be uh, uh, really, uh, I would say, uh, part of this big change movement in Lebanon. They are a very small minority, but they are there and they are doing a lot of noise uh, in order to discredit kata'ib. And these people, because maybe they want to be candidates in regions where kata'ib are, or maybe because um, there is uh, a personal problem with uh, some people in kata'ib, maybe because... Uh, so there is always a personal agenda in some of... Yeah. In most of the very high voices you hear. But let's say, and I like, I like the way you broke it down, actually. It yeah. makes sense to me. Let's say that crowd is there in good times and bad times. Mm -hmm. There's that personal ambition yeah. angle. And then you have the other camp within that percentage, and I, I like the way you framed it, that seems to want the right things for Lebanon, but is also very adamant at criticizing any group that pre-exists October 2019. And it may be a sensitive question, but I'd, I'd like to ask you, is there anything that Kateb could do more than other parties in initiating what you, dis what you said earlier, which resonates with me, have that reconciliation? The national government has not pursued it. Clearly, it's something that we don't have. There's a lot of missing data. Uh, we have film that tries to do this. Uh, two of my favorite movies are both sides of the story, West Beirut by Ziad Dwayri, and The Insult by Ziad Dwayri. One about Demur, one about El Gherbi. It's the same director offering pain from both sides. Kate'ib is obviously portrayed in one side of that story, but is there anything that can be done to at least heal those wounds on your terms? Beyond mentioning it, which I think is good, parties should say that they did bad things during the Civil War. No one is innocent in that sense. But that explanation and maybe that healing, is that part of any program that Kate'ib could at least initiate and say, we're ready? And part of our program is to have this truth and reconciliation process. Mm. Not only for Kata'ib. I think that this, uh, maybe Kata'ib is the vis visible part of the iceberg, but I think that the issue is in the hearts of all the Lebanese people mm. from all sects. Yeah. Um, I think this is. I think this is an issue that should be addressed. We are ready to do it any time, and we are doing it. And we are saying clearly that yes, we uh, we have thousands of our party members that gave their life for defending Lebanon, and um, and um, a lot of mistakes were done. A lot of things that should be avoided have been done, and we are not saying that we are. Uh, uh, we didn't do any mistake or there wasn't any uh, uh, things that happened in the world that are, uh, we are not at all saying that. Mm. We know we did our self-criticism. We know exactly where we were right. We know exactly where we were wrong. Mm. We know mm. exactly all the exactions that, were, that happened during the war. But this is something that you don't do alone. We are ready to do that. We already did it with the Palestinians. We had this uh, uh, truth and reconciliation with the Palestinians in 2008 in, uh, for a day. We stayed there for a day yes. with all the representatives of uh, Fatah yeah. movement. And uh, a huge uh, communique was, um, was uh, published afterwards, and it's still there. We did the same with Wali Jumblat. We did the yeah. same with Slam and Frangi. We did our part, but bilateral, with, with those who wanted to do that with us. Right. Mm, so, but this is not enough. I think this is a process that should be, um, uh, that should be organized by the Lebanese state that includes everyone, that opens up all the wounds so you can... Uh, uh, close the wounds in, a, in the right way. But on our side, 
we are open. We are open to, to anything. The problem that we have today is that our country is uh, under uh, a quasi occupation. We have an armed militia that is killing our people, that is controlling our country, our state, our uh, institutions. This militia imposed us our president. It is imposing our governments. It is controlling our elections. And we are somehow in a state of occupation, except that those who are the occupiers uh, have Lebanese passports, but they are um, in control of the state. They are taking orders from abroad, from uh, um, an, an, a foreign regime uh, with um, a religious ideology. And uh, unfortunately, um, we have this fight to do. We are not in a normal state where everything is okay, so let's have the luxury to... Um, you know, uh, stop everything and do this uh, in-depth uh, kind of um, of uh, 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 psychological um, uh, psychological work on ourselves, yeah. etc. So we have a collapsed economy. We have uh, a sovereignty that is totally uh, destroyed. We have people that are still dying until today. Look, man, Slim. Uh, was assassinated uh, a year ago, or maybe less. So Feb yeah, uh, half a year ago. Things are not ending. We yeah. are in the midst of a huge fight. We are ready to do our part, but this is not the priority of Lebanon. Kataib is not the priority of Lebanon today. The priority of Lebanon is to get out of the situation that we're in, to get rid of a political mafia that is totally under Hezbollah's uh, umbrella and doing what Hezbollah wants. We have to get rid of these people. We have to uh, push the Lebanese people to rise up against this big uh, 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 big uh, uh, this huge uh, issue that we have in the country. I agree. And this is a common point that I want to flush out with you. And before we jump into sovereignty, which I think is the issue of the day, <laughs> it's, a, it's what happens when you say sovereignty too many times. The microphone <laughs> falls. <laughs> I, I, I appreciate that you're able to talk about the challenging years of Lebanon's history. I know you've done this in, in, in public venues and private as well. Uh, you don't have any fear in talking about the wounds. And I think that's a principle that I admire. So I'm, I'm glad you do that, and even if it's limited... But only let, me, let me tell you something. You have a lot of um, influencers that are trying to drag the young generation of young Lebanese into the wounds of the past because they have these wounds. They want, to in, they want the young generation to inherit the same hatred they have themselves because they, are, they were part of this Lebanese war and they were taking a side in this war. So under the umbrella of we don't want wars anymore, they attack uh, between brackets the old uh, parties, yeah. but they attack only half of them or part of them, and they forget the others. <laughs> so it's, it's weird because they attack Kataib on issues, okay, but they don't attack the other groups that have the same issues. So it's only uh, the Kata'ib. It's like only Kata'ib did the war. We were fighting ourselves. There was no counterpart. For example, I never hear someone attacking the Communist Party because they were a part of the war, as if the Communist Party were doing, uh, I would say, uh, uh, they were wedding planners in during the war, <laughs> or uh, they used to be, you know. But do you, you, no one attacks, for example, uh, on this front, the front mm -hmm. of the war. No one talks about anyone else than Kataeb. It's not like, you know. But Sam, I'm, I'm and you, you give me permission to go one step further. Yeah. Because it's it's a sensitive point. I don't want to. I mean, it's it's something that's worth talking about without making it emotional. 
do you think it's simply due to the fact that as Lebanon collapsed, Kate'e became the most important militia in Lebanon's history? That it's not just... Um, it, it inherited a problem, which was the army imploding. And you said it earlier, and it's, it's fact. The president saying, you're on your own. Kate'e goes from being a national party to becoming a very, very important, if not the most important militia during the Civil War. That it's tied up in those years, more than the years before and more than the years after. Mm. And I'll give you an example. I grew up between this country and America, and any time you read and study about Lebanon, you have to study about Sabra Shatila. It's a part of any book you read, it's in every video you watch, it's a, it's an, it's a terrible massacre that becomes the story. And then this word gets tagged to it, perhaps unfairly, perhaps in ways that is not correct, it could be even inaccurate altogether, but there's a lumping. Suddenly, massacre, kate'ev. And if you're growing up, studying and reading and only thinking about that, it becomes almost impossible to drive that wedge and say, this is kate'ib. These are massacres that happened. They're not the same. The reason I mentioned Ziad uh, Dwayri earlier is because I think he did something so profound. He took the initiative and said, it's not just West Beirut, it's East Beirut. It's not just Muslims, it's Christians. Demur happened. There's another massacre many Lebanese don't talk about. If there's an international audience, it doesn't know about Demur or any other massacre that happened. But there's that one that takes the stage and it's associated with Bashir Shmeida's assassination. So do you think that is the core issue at the end of the day? Because it's so hard to talk about what happened in those weeks and months, that it gets, in a way, it becomes a psychological problem that you have to... Yeah. You know. Let's agree on something. You have to take a decision. If the issue is we have to understand what happened during the war and who did what, and who is responsible for what, and why this happened, and why that happened. This is a whole a process yeah. that we should all sit together and let's talk about it. Because yeah. I cannot answer you by bits and pieces about something that is so important and so painful mm -hmm. for everyone. Mm. This is a whole episode or maybe a whole season of episodes. Probably a so whole... <laughs> I am ready to do that. I, yeah. I am really ready to do that anytime to sit and let's talk about the war. And let me tell you, there is not one book on the Lebanese war that I didn't read. There is not one person that participated in this war in our party and our adversaries at that time that I didn't talk to, including, <laughs> including, including George Howey, who mm. was assassinated. Yes. I did talks and talks and talks with him about this. And we tried to analyze, we tried to understand, and uh, that there's a lot of things that should be said about Sabra and Shatila. There's a lot of things that should be said about uh, Damur, about Ka. Yeah. The Ka massacre about uh, Ras Albak about you know massacres were uh, when you have a war in a civil war uh, when you have um, combats in a civil war like Lebanon uh, and it is uh, um, sectarian it's a sectarian war it became a sectarian war at some point you will have atrocities. And you can see atrocities in every place you had a sectarian war. Go to Yugoslavia, go to Kosovo, go to all these places where you had this kind of conflicts. Yeah. You will see atrocities. Go to Sarajevo and read what happened there. Of course. Yeah. So I'm just saying, Roni, 
that during this war, four million Lebanese were there. And most of them were taking sides with this against this, with this against this. So, okay, let's say Kataib were there. But if you go to the father or the uncle or the grandfather of anyone who was in the street in 17th of October, he would also have to answer for things he said or done or sides he took. Right. Um, or maybe he was part of this. The Lebanon was, all of Lebanon was in a state of war. Now, the issue that we have to ask ourselves is the following. Are we ready to move on or no? This is the question. Let me, yes. as uh, the Qatar party leader, answer you <laughs> yes, sir. For, for once. <laughs> I don't usually talk in this uh, capacity. I am a 40-year-old. I was eight years when the war ended. I studied in USG. I traveled abroad. I studied abroad. I um, somehow I managed to understand how humanity works. And I want to have, I want to do everything in my power. So what happened during the war doesn't repeat itself. This is my goal in life. And let me tell you more than this. Those who have wounds are much more uh, uh, aware of how bad war is than those who doesn't know anything about war. This is why Qatar Party today is the most anti-war party in Lebanon because we know what it means to lose someone. We know what it means to have uh, your friend killed. We know what it means to visit families of, of, uh, of martyrs. We know what it means to lose someone. This is why we will do everything in our power. So history doesn't repeat itself. And I wish we can uh, go from there. Because if you want to hold accountable on the war, it's not about Kata'ib. You have to hold accountable 4 million Lebanese people. And it's not only Kata'ib, because Kata'ib was not fighting itself during the war. <laughs> well, I, I share that sentiment fully, and I'm glad that you're saying it this way, because I think that certain parties in Lebanese history are getting an unfair criticism for the wrong reasons. And I wanted to hear it from you, because I do think a group like Kata'ib, it doesn't have to be only Kata'ib, but Kata'ib is doing a great job at reform. And I think that is the challenge, is reforming everything in this country. And there's the parallel story, which is sovereignty. And absolute reform is impossible without sovereignty. Without sovereignty. So thank you for letting me ask you those sensitive questions about the war. And I, I agree with the pursuit of national reconciliation so that everyone can talk about these things. But that said, Lebanon lost its sovereignty almost half a century ago. 1975, the civil war begins, but it's 1969, 1970, where Lebanon as a country, as an independent country, wobbly maybe, but it still functioned, it began to collapse. And you and I grew up in a country that had no independence. We grew up under occupation. You said quasi-occupation regarding Hezbollah's influence today in Iran. It feels in many ways like an extension to the Syrian era. Maybe in some ways easier, in other ways not. And we're here in 2021 still talking about this issue. And you said it at the beginning. How much longer do we have to keep talking about this issue? It's 100 years since Greater Lebanon, and we're still talking about it. I think... Lebanon cannot function with a sub-state group like Hezbollah. And I think trying to negotiate around that subject is impossible. 
And I think any party that is in the opposition, if they're not willing to use that language, it's missing the story. That said, are we simply waiting today for a realignment in the region? Are we waiting for these direct talks between the Saudis and Iranian regime to hit us? Or is there a bad scenario where Iran steps away, but a Russian-backed Syrian regime steps in in a way that's terrible for Lebanon? And I'm asking it this way because I don't know if parties in Lebanon have any control over the situation. I've heard you say it many times over many years, what you believe in, and it's more or less the same. In those years, Lebanon got worse. Sovereignty got worse. Independence is almost gone. Every other group that tried to engage Hezbollah lost. Those that pander to Hezbollah also are now part of the problem. And I can't think of a local solution. So is this just a wait and see situation? And does Kataib have any capability to address this from within Lebanon? You know, when, when Lebanon was occupied by Syria, we were asking ourselves the same question. <laughs> <laughs> Are we will one day our children see Lebanon without the Syrian occupation? We used to ask ourselves this question, and that didn't prevent us from continue our fight and from uh, going to the streets and calling for the withdrawal of the Syrian troops and getting beaten and getting and to get uh, arrested and all that stuff. Um, and one day came uh, the student movement against the Syrian occupation was actually the candle that uh, managed to light the Cedar Revolution. Yeah. And if there wasn't a student movement before the Cedar Revolution, the Cedar Revolution wouldn't have uh, uh, wouldn't be wouldn't have happened. So uh, for me today, uh, what our role is to continue the fight and use all the resources that we have in our hands to fight, whether it's the street, whether it's our voice, whether it's the media or the coming election or any way to express ourselves and to fight. And um, one day, uh, the international and regional uh, situation or, uh, will somehow be in favor of our ideas and then we'll be ready to take any opportunity to achieve our goal and to get our sovereignty and independence the same way it happened in 2005. But if we are not there and if there is no candle, mm. even if the region and international um, course, uh, it crosses our, uh, our uh, goals, we will not be able to benefit from it. So we have to be there, we have to continue the fight, and uh, we should not give up. Do you think 2005, going back in time a bit, and I know that you were not the head of Kateib in 2005, no, I was not. but you were politically fully aware of what was happening? And that was a magical moment where we saw things changing in favor of Lebanon. We put the first tent in, on, right. in, in the uh, in Martyrs see the revolution. And it was <laughs> the way you're describing it earlier that you had student protests building up to it. You have Hariri's assassination, which elevates it to an international story. And then you have a million Lebanese joining hands, uh, yeah. opponents from the war joining hands, saying we want Syria out. It's a very magical moment. Do you sense that even back then, it was a, we have to wait and see how much pressure will be applied against the Syrian regime, or whether Iran will reconsider Hezbollah? Because I, I sense that we're in the same situation over and over. It's a, there's not much we can do here about this problem. We wait. 
And I, no, I, I, there is. But you said fight do. and and like media. Yeah, right? no, no, not only media. It's it's uh, you have to use all the tools that you have in your hands to fight. What are those tools? This is the, these are the things I think about all the time, as as a peaceful patriot who doesn't want war. Uh, it's the tools that are in the hands of any uh, um, uh, peaceful uh, resistance, because the only alternative to peaceful resistance is to bear arms and to fight back. And I don't think that uh, Lebanon uh, can uh, uh, should uh, use any. Uh, we should we should not go back. Yeah. To, to, to these days to violence and yeah. all that stuff we have to uh, do this peaceful resistance and there are examples in the world you use the streets you use media you use your voice you use election Th these are the tools that are in your hands you have to use them fully and uh, international relations continue to spread the word abroad, do a lot of lobbying outside. Uh, and that's what, that, that's what we're doing uh, now. Um, but it is true that uh, there is no uh, magic... Uh, uh, wand or bullet, wand. depending on wand. which... <laughs> magic wand. <laughs> no, but you're saying election, and that's the issue I wanted to wrap it up with. We saw elections in the last 15, 16 years. We saw March 14 victories. It's 2005 and 2009. A platform that wins the majority, and then you have dozens of people hiding in their apartments. They can't move on the streets. They're worried about being killed. I mean, the Phoenicia is closed right now, but I remember driving by the Phoenicia where people are hiding in that hotel. They don't want to move. It's a strange situation that this luxury hotel is housing MPs and ministers that can't move. And we both share that fate. Your brother, my father, part of that camp, killed. Elections, to me, don't seem to be addressing the story correctly. And next year's elections are an important chapter. But do you think they really matter? if that one issue cannot be resolved through elections. Because we have majorities that demanded change. They were murdered. What makes this round different? It should address the one issue that is the weapons of Hezbollah. It should be the headline. And the problem is not that we were killed and that we were in the Phoenicia, and that even when we won the election, they came and assassinated us. This is not the issue. When you are fighting an ideologically driven militia, and when you are fighting an occupation, or when you are fighting uh, huge uh, uh, demons like this, you have to uh, accept the sacrifices that, that you, you are giving. And I accept uh, the, sacrifice, uh, the sacrifice of my brother in this fight. And I respect it and I cherish it. And I want to stay, um, I would say, uh, tr uh, true to this, to this sacrifice and be up to it. The issue is not the sacrifice. The issue is the compromise. The compromise. <laughs> yeah, this is my problem. The compromise the referring compromise to... The compromise of all our allies in March 14 that decided after all these sacrifices to give up the country and give it to Hezbollah. And specifically, this is by electing Michel Aoun. Yeah. By electing Michel Aoun, yeah. they took the votes of those patriots that voted for March 14 in 2009 and they offered them to Hezbollah. And this is treason. Because when you are elected based on a program, and after you take the votes and you get elected, you take this program and you put it in the trash and you do the exact opposite, this is treason. 
So I wouldn't have had any uh, issue with all the sacrifices that were given in that period, even my brother's sacrifice, if at least we stood up to these principles and we stayed true to these sacrifices and we didn't give up and we continued the fight and we didn't compromise, then uh, it would have meant something. But my issue with uh, our resistance at that time is the compromise that came afterwards made by people without any kind of, uh, of um, with no principles. They decided to give up on everything and all the sacrifices that were done at that time. This is my issue. Let's so go, let's, this is why yeah. an election mm. can be a way of resisting. When my brother was elected in 2000, during the Syrian occupation, and he went up uh, in the parliament and said, I demand the withdrawal of the Syrian troops from Lebanon, and he was the only MP yeah. with, uh, with uh, MP Mkhaybir who called for the withdrawal of the Syrian troops from Lebanon. This is an act of resistance. So, yes, election can be an act of resistance if you stay true to it and you don't compromise afterwards. <laughs> Could I play devil's advocate here knowing, yes, that, knowing that we both have this burden? Your brother is a brave human being who stood up demanding an end to Lebanon's occupation. At a time, very few were willing to say this openly, let alone at parliament. And five years later, there's a victory in parliament echoing his speech. Three years later, we're forced into a Doha national unity government. Mm -hmm. A year later, we win again in 2009. Mm -hmm. Five years later, mm -hmm. we're back in what this... Is, what is this happening every time? Every time you have your allies who are compromising every time. So the solution is to get rid of these compromising parties and bring people to the parliament that are not compromising uh, uh, individuals. So let me ask you there, this, this is the point I want to get at. Do you think the way out mm. of getting rid of these treasonous mm. actors is through elections? I, I, give me another way of doing it. So this is It's a, not the ideal one because yeah. election will not happen in the ideal situation in ideal uh, environment hmm. but unfortunately it's this or nothing unless you want to bear arms and go fight this is maybe the only thing that can actually uh, shake the barrel hmm. but and, and except this yeah solution which personally I don't accept because I am. I want to do everything in my my power all my life, so pe the Lebanese people don't live what we lived in the war. So this is for me an option that is the worst one. The only other way to fight back is to get in the parliament a block of parliamentarians that are not ready to compromise and that have a loud voice, and that are true to themselves, and that are willing to fight so I'm gonna in ask, the institutions. Let's flip it around. The opposition parties love to talk about Kate'ib all the time, to the point that it becomes almost a daily subject. I'm interested from you. How do you see the opposition parties in this fight? I don't know if most opposition parties are willing to go down this road. I think I, some are. I, I think that those who uh, don't want to talk about the sovereignty of Lebanon, we cannot work with them. Because this means that they are uh, somehow accomplices of, of this situation. Because when you, when you want to say that you are in the opposition and you don't see the issue of sovereignty, you don't see an armed militia that is uh, uh, controlling the country, it means that you are not genuine. It means that you are 
a, a, a new compromising figure and that you are not willing to fight for what's right unless you don't believe in sovereignty then I have an issue with you and if you believe in sovereignty and you're not seeing that you have an issue of sovereignty in Lebanon then there is a, another issue <laughs> with you so for me I think that 80% of the opposition today is, so, is a very aware of the issue of sovereignty and ready to fight for it. 80%. This, assume, this let's is assume, my belief. Let's assume that's true. Let's say it's Unfortunately, the, the 20% are as loud or maybe louder than the 80%. Uh, but still, on the ground, in the, in the Lebanese population, 80% of those who are supporting uh, the revolution are pro-sovereignty. But let's say that's true. And then 80% are in parliament. Mm -hmm. And suddenly there's a sizable block in parliament that represents this view. Mm -hmm. Do you see a way to engage this issue in parliament? And I think I, yes. So how does a local parliament tackle that geopolitical nightmare? Is it in the parliament's agenda even to talk about those issues? It's not on the agenda because you don't have a sizable block in the parliament that is ready to fight this fight. Once you have a sizable part of the parliament that is willing to go and to uh, fight this inside the institution, then uh, it will be uh, a subject and it will be an issue in the parliament. But you need a sizable group to hold this uh, cause and defend it in the parliament. And I think, unfortunately, Roni, and I go back to this every time, we know that it's not ideal, and we know that it's not going to change uh, overnight. Unfortunately, we don't have other tools, except uh, find another uh, proxy elsewhere in the region and fight back and uh, play the same game. We don't want that. Or, yeah. or uh, take arms and fight. Unfortunately, we don't have other tools. Let's be, uh, let's be clear about this. So for me, yes, if we have courageous, courageous people in the parliament that are ready to fight this, uh, it will offer the Lebanese people a leadership in the institution, a legal and a legitimate leadership, an elected leadership that can uh, uh, mobilize people uh, and maybe work for four years in order to get the majority next time. Or at least have also a partner for the international community. The international community today they want to meet with the with the opposition. Who they who do they meet? <laughs> they don't have a partner. You need a legitimate and elected partner for the Lebanese people on one hand and for the international community on the other. So whatever you want to do, there is no harm to have an elected bloc in the parliament that is defending these values. So Starting from there, if, right. there, if there are any other ideas yeah. that can have more effect and that can bring more results, I'm all in. So it's really, <laughs> so, it's really being in place in case things line up better so that there is an opposition or a different regime able to seize on the moment. Because I, 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 I think I understand this, that no harm really means... You want these voices in Parliament when things are working better in terms of Lebanon's sovereignty. And even if it's getting worse, you don't want people. You don't want people to fight this right. fight in the Parliament. Yeah. So, anyways. Even if Parliament has limited impact, it yes, is. We yeah. Understand. It right. is limited because you don't have the majority, but you can get to a stage where you can actually get the majority. Things will not stay as they are. I think that Hezbollah is changing the identity of Lebanon. And this fight is going to be stronger by the day. I think that the Lebanese people 
will understand the meaning of Hezbollah controlling Lebanon on their daily life. When we say, why there is no investments in Lebanon? Because Hezbollah is not allowing this country to be a stable country. Why we have an issue with smuggling? Because Hezbollah is controlling the borders. Why do we have an issue with the electricity? Because Hezbollah is controlling the, um, the, the, the network. So yeah. when, you, when you, every issue that is facing the Lebanese people today, or most of them, I would say 90% of them, are in a way or another linked to Hezbollah controlling the country. I think also reform-minded people... And, and let, let me yeah. just one more point. Of course, point. yes. Why the corrupt politicians after the most beautiful uprising in the history of Lebanon, if Hezbollah was not protecting the mafia that is controlling Lebanon today, do you think that the, March, the, the, the 17th of October revolution wouldn't have, uh, uh, they wouldn't have uh, fled the country mm. if Hezbollah w was not protecting mm. this mafia? So... When you look at it from all angles, mm. you will see that Hezbollah is the main player. And those who don't, don't want to see that, they have uh, an issue of credibility. And I think reform-minded people in the years after 2005 spent too much time, not because they wanted to, but they had to, talking about security matters rather than talking about economic issues and mm -hmm. corruption because there was a real threat exactly. of getting killed when you talk about serious reform in Lebanon. Exactly. I think that also is missing in, in, the, sub, in the conversation. Sammy, I want to wrap it up with giving you a chance to say something on your terms. The moment I, sp I posted that I'll be speaking with you, like hundreds of messages come in. And it's 50-50. It's 50% 50, 50. 50 saying, finally, you're speaking to somebody that you should have spoken to three years ago with all those emoticons of hearts and smiley faces and you name it, Lebanese flags. The other half, how dare you speak to him? Stop giving this man a platform. Don't let him sound credible or they would write, Kellon yani kellon. After that, Sami Jmail is part of the regime. Now, I don't think that's a fair way of describing you, and we talked about this. But I'd like you, if you could, imagine these people are speaking with you directly, and maybe you meet them sometimes in person. Maybe you even engage them online. What is it that they're missing at the end of the day to at least better understand where Kata'ib stands, why you feel 100% that it's part of this opposition right now, why you think it's reforming in the right way, and why you want Kata'ib to be part of next year's election, and not listen to voices that say, skip the elections. Don't go. I've heard this repeatedly. Why should you be in the elections next year? Give it to the more pure opposition parties. I think that actions uh, speak more than words. Uh, I'm just asking everyone to um, uh, judge us on our actions and our political positions and not on personal agendas or historical uh, background. Because if you want to go to historic backgrounds, Everyone has a lot to say on everyone. It's not about Kata'ib or not Kata'ib. Our party is uh, taking the right positions. Let's at least uh, base, base our um, view of Kata'ib on what we're doing, what we're saying, our political agenda, our political program, the economic, social, education, health, uh, on the sovereignty front, on all fronts. 
And uh, I am not anymore in a position to, um, let's say, um, uh, we said everything in the past two years. We talked to these people. Those who were convinced were convinced. Those who are still um, uh, have some unanswered questions, we are ready to answer them anytime. And I'm ready to go to any place and to talk to anyone if, if there is a goodwill. But I will not stop based on, um, I would say, uh, the internet armies of some political parties that have an interest into putting, uh, into dividing the opposition, or those who have personal agendas and they don't have an interest into uniting the opposition. I will just tell all these people, take the example of the engineering elections. You will see that an a coalition regrouping all the opposition, including Kata'ib, including our friends, uh, look at the results. 75%. It was a landslide. Does that, in your let's, mind... Yeah. Let's, let's try to learn from this. Kata'ib strategically decided to not go in the sort of in the front of the engineering and architecture syndicate election, which is a political calculation that worked. It made sense. Is there any credibility to the voices that are saying Kateib should do the same thing for the national elections? Because I, I hear this what, argument. What did we do in the, in the, in the engineering elections? We, had, we did the fight. We, we were part of the coalition. We had candidates. Mm. We won. And this is how we do things. We don't try, never, we never tried to take any leadership because it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. No one can take the leadership of a big cross-sectarian opposition in Lebanon. No one can do that. It should be a teamwork. So let, be, let me be clear. My target as uh, the president of the Qatar party is for the Lebanese opposition to win the election. This is my target. It's not about Qatar winning or who will win what. It's to change this country. This is our goal. We don't care about seats. We don't care about who wins what. What we care about is to give hope to the new generation and to uh, give a slap to this um, corrupt and uh, compromising establishment that is destroying our country and selling it to Hezbollah. This is our goal. And in order to do that, we have to unite. I think Kata'ib is on the right path. I say this as an observer, not as somebody who's an expert on Kata'ib, it's just an audience member who's watched this party, grew up with this party, knows this party under different leadership, names that are now distant memory. Some of them during the Syrian occupation years where Kata'ib was not really what it was meant to be. Your return, your brother's return, your father's return, and everything that happened since 2005 and the principles that remain consistent. And for me, it's the principles that I admire, it's the willingness to reform, and it's the genuine desire to maintain a peaceful process in this country. Because if any party remembers emotionally, mentally, and physically, the pain of what war does to this country, it's Kata'ib and every other group that ended up in that very painful moment. So there are lessons there. People do not want to go back. And I'm glad that you're saying this repeatedly up front without any hesitation. You want the process to work. So I admire this. What I also admire is that 
you're healing wounds on your term. And for me, this is everything. I think running away from the pain is the worst decision possible. And I think many opportunities come where you could abandon this ship altogether and pursue an easier life. Um, but you're choosing something that's difficult, stressful, time-consuming, and uh, you're doing it on your terms. I don't think there's anything better than that. It's, you can wake up in a Lebanon that's uh, falling apart, but your sanity is intact. And I think that's, that's very important. So it's an honor to sit with you in your office, to uh, even get a feel for how you spend your daily life and your, your work routine. It was an honor to meet your wife earlier. And just to consider you a friend in general, it's, it's a privilege. So thank you for letting me into your world, Sammy. Thank you, Ronnie. And thank you for giving me your Friday night. Because I know you have better <laughs> things to do than talk to and, me. And uh, thank you. Thank you for everything you're doing. Continue to be a free voice uh, in the desert. <laughs> and, uh, and I hope that uh, we will meet again uh, and things would have changed. And uh, one last few words. Of course. Let's not give uh, Hezbollah and the Mafia any free gifts by not working day and night for the unity of the opposition. This is a crime against this country if we don't unite. Together, we can change Lebanon. Lebanon is not Maram Khayel and Hamra. Lebanon, it's Matan, Kesirwain, Batroun, Zgherta, Pshere, Akkar, Tripoli, Beka, Hirmel, Tabatiye, Saida, Sur, Ain Ibel, Bint Jbel, Beirut, Abda, Alay, Shuf. Lebanon is not Maram Khayel. We have to understand that if we want to win this election, we need to have presence and we need to have activists and we need to have the power to fight an election in the forest places of Lebanon. And in order to do that, you cannot do it from Marum Khayel. You need to work with people who have, uh, who can uh, get you to these very far places of Lebanon in order to get, to convince them and to get them to join the fight for change and the fight for a united and sovereign and independent Lebanon. You cannot do this from Marm Khayr or from Hamra or from Jemaizi. And I think that if we don't manage to be smart enough to have partners in each and every region of Lebanon, from all sects, from all the regions, we will not be able to win this fight. It will stay an elitist approach made in Beirut and that will die in Beirut. If we want it to be a national movement, if we want to win this election, if we want to win the fight for change, it should be on the, across, across the country from the south to the north to the Beka to Beirut. I look forward to that Lebanon. I also look forward to brave voices like your brothers in parliament saying the truth about what Iran and Hezbollah are doing to this country. And if that's the limited strength of having a majority in parliament, that's the starting point. But I really would like to see that happen because I don't want to spend the rest of my life in Lebanon tackling this issue and giving it to my children. I think you don't want to either. No. So that's a goal I hope the opposition inherits. And an eloquence delivers the way your brother did, and my father, and others like them. 
Thank you, Sammy. Thank you, Ronnie. Good luck. Thank you.